So way back in module two, you had done a couple of readings that we never went over during that lecture. One from Tremaine about archaeological sites for Alaska natives, specifically on national park lands, and another by Peter Kalifornsky about a traditional story about the origin of Denina clans. I'd like to now revisit those topics and give a very brief overview of the idea of Alaska native origins. So, um, and it really belongs in mod in unit one. So even though we missed it in module two, covering those couple of readings, I want to revisit them now. And so I want to ask a question, which is why are we interested in origins? We clearly are as human beings, right? We love um, our origin stories for our superheroes, our origin stories for our villains. Uh, we love our origin stories for ourselves. When we write narratives about ourselves, when we do genetic testing of ourselves, we are interested in origins. But I mean more specifically, why are we interested in the origin of Alaska Native people? Certainly enough ink has been spilt on this topic with archaeological evidence, and linguistic evidence, and different kinds of research, um, as well as the traditional stories of indigenous nations themselves. So why is it that people find this to be an interesting topic? I think it depends on the person. I think, obviously, Alaska Native nations developed stories, uh, had stories from time immemorial that answered about their place as a people, as specific nations, and I think this is what cultures do. They want to understand themselves um, in sacred ways. I think anthropologists are very interested in Alaska Native origins for a variety of reasons, including that they most anthropologists consider Alaska to be the first part of the Americas that was settled by indigenous people, and therefore sort of a gateway to understanding how the peopling of the Americas took place, in addition to helping us understand modern Alaska Native nations' origins. So there's lots of good reasons, I think, to find this topic interesting. A second question is, what different types of origin stories do we tell, and how can these origin stories differ? And they can differ in a lot of ways, as you saw, might have noticed when you compare the Kalifornsky reading, where he tells a traditional Denina story about the origin of Denina clans, and the Tremaine reading, where he talks about archaeological evidence of different uh, cultural sites in Alaska, you might notice that they differ in epistemology, in the sense that they have different ways of proving their point, of determining truth. The Denina stories uh, that Kalifornsky is drawing on are stories that have been passed down from presumably from time immemorial, and therefore sort of have their own validity in that way, whereas the archaeological narrative depends upon what can be found in the archaeological record, which is of course never perfect, and there's a lot of things we never find and that isn't properly preserved. So there are two different ways of sort of determining truth. There's also different ontology. To a great degree, the two different stories kind of tell a story of people moving around Alaska, but in the Kalifornsky story, there's a reference to an island in the sky and people descending from it, a supernatural type of thing, uh, which wouldn't occur in the archaeological narrative. And so sometimes our origin stories differ very much between archaeology and sacred narratives, which is not to say that one is better than the other, but simply to note the difference and to suggest that there might be good reasons for the differences. Again, I think there's value in determining origins for intellectual purposes, though, and also for cultural purposes. I think uh, for Native nations, uh, some Native nations sponsor their own archaeology for the purpose of understanding and connecting with their own origins, as do many groups of people. So again, when you looked back over the Kalifornsky reading, there were some similarities to the archaeology reading as far as sort of movements of people and the idea that indigenous peoples have been in Alaska for a very, very long time, but also differences both in terms of the supernatural side of it, but also just the origin of clans as a focus, a much more microscopic and narrow focus on Denina people uh, and on their clan system, which makes sense, right? Sacred narratives of specific groups of people are often used not so much to tell the story of all of humanity, although sometimes they are, but more so to tell the story of them as humanity, who they are as a people. Indeed, that's true even of um, the book of Genesis. We think of Genesis and the uh, Abrahamic traditions as sort of the creation of everything, and that's what Genesis 1 and 2 are. But most of Genesis is the story of where the Israelites came from, and specifically the 12 sons of Jacob. And so it's a family and a people story. And in the same way, most nations across the uh, most societies develop stories to explain where they came from as a people or have those stories passed down or receive those stories from supernatural sources.
All right, well, let's now talk a bit more about the Tremaine reading and about the idea of the archaeology of Alaska. So this is a rather confusing diagram, but essentially what this diagram is, is showing that human modern Homo sapiens, as far as physical anthropologists believe, uh, developed 200,000 years ago in East Africa. This is the origin story, again, according to... Uh, physical anthropology. I don't require you to believe in that story or agree with that story, and indeed, uh, it may conflict with some people's cultural origin stories, and I want to respect and honor those. I take those extremely seriously. Uh, so this is one story among many that we could tell. It's the story told by physical anthropologists, and in that story, uh, based on the archaeological and physical anthropology evidence, we would say, they would say that humanity evolved uh, into its modern form 200,000 years ago, and then started to spread across the continent, and to some degree, mixed with pre-existing populations. Um, by 70 million years ago, human, or sorry, 70,000 years ago, he, uh, human beings are in the Middle East, 45,000 years ago in Europe, uh, 20, but by some, some of the most recent settled areas would actually be the Americas. So in the point of view of uh, physical anthropologists and archaeologists, this would have occurred around 25,000 years ago. And so most anthropologists believe that um, the indigenous peoples of the America are descended from East Asian slash Northeast Asian slash Central Asian populations, and specifically moved from Siberia into Alaska. How? Well, there's the rub. So the theory for a long time was what we call the Bering Land Bridge, which is basically that there was a time period around this time period when the waters were when it was very, very cold, and so waters were tied up in glaciers, and as a result, you have a piece of exposed land between Russia, what we now think of as Russia and Alaska, and the groups moved from there down into the Americas. Over time, we came to realize that probably this area was um, blocked off by a glacier for a long time, so probably people were in Beringia for a very long time, what we call the Beringia standstill hypothesis, uh, developing different genetics and languages and cultures as they were there for thousands of years. Now, that is kind of the dominant theory. One kind of issue is that it we keep finding sites around the Americas that may potentially be older than what you would expect. Um, as far as, because the theory was that they, the indigenous people came into Alaska and then moved through an ice-free corridor all the way down. Um, the problem is that when this corridor was open and when this area was open doesn't always match up properly with now some of the settlements we're finding uh, and also some of the ways we're understanding better the geology of these areas and so other anthropologists believe that probably boats were taken doo -doo -doo, and then the americas were settled that way kind of along a coastal route um but either way the dominant theory is that native americans came from uh, asia and there are several reasons for this one of which is of course just the obvious geological one or geographic one of from there to there uh, one of which is that if humans originated here they had to get here somewhere and so this seems like a more logical the most logical route as far as the easiest way to get from one continent to the other uh, and then of course there are genetic similarities that people bring up between native american populations and east and northeast asian populations and central asian populations uh, there are also some cultural and similarities um, but the genetic evidence is probably the one that people consider the most telling and some morphological similarities associated with that such as very subtle things such as certain dental patterns so uh, again this is just sort of a map of what how there would have been a bearing land bridge back in the day um, and again this idea of the ice-free corridor versus the coastline migration and it's still pretty uh, up, up for grabs which it is these aren't the only theories of the peopling of America. Uh, certainly, there have been a variety of theories from um, non-archaeology sources. And then there have also been, even within the archaeological community, you have, for example, the Salutrian hypothesis, which, because of some uh, similarities between tool types, hypothesizes that the settlement of America actually came from southern Europe by boat across the Atlantic into the Americas. Certainly possible. Well, let me rephrase that. Certainly, 
plausible in the sense that it's a theory that's been proposed and that is still out there. Um, by far and away, though, the consensus view is from Asia rather than the Slytherin hypothesis. I think most anthropologists hold that there's not enough evidence, at least as it currently stands, to really support the Slytherin hypothesis, although there are some that hold to it. The vast majority hold to um, out of Asia as the hypothesis. All right, well, so that puts indigenous peoples in Alaska, and what happens from there? Well, some break off and go into further south, according to this theory, but where um, does what happens to those who remain in Alaska? There's a lot of movement back and forth, as you might have gathered from the Tremaine reading, uh, where there's actually probably several different waves, at least three of indigenous people moving into the area, perhaps multiple from Siberia, uh, perhaps at least one coming in actually from sort of northern Canada, or what we now think of as northern Canada, and migrating back into Alaska. And we can tell that, for example, from the fact that there's genetic diversity that would suggest that it was more than one uh, wave of migration. But we can also tell that because there was distinct differences in the archaeological remains. So as archaeologists to determine when one culture was in an area versus another. We base that in part based on the dating of the different sites, but also in part on very different types of like tools and artifacts. Um, so if you look at it that way, each set of really different tools and artifacts is a different cultural tradition. And we can see for each of these different parts of Alaska, you had different cultural traditions, right? Paleoarctic, then Northern Archaic, then Athabascan. Uh, Paleo Paleo-Indian and Paleo-Arctic, then Northern Athabascan, then or archaic, then ATST, Arctic Small Tool Tradition, then Norton, then North Maritime, and then modern Inupaya. I'm not going to require you to memorize these, at least at this present moment. That's by no means my point. I do want to make a couple of bigger points. So again, you don't need to memorize all these, but number one, our knowledge is constantly evolving. Number two, there are uncertain things here. So for example, when this shifts to this, is this culture just developing new tools, or does this actually mean that a new group of people came and displaced this group of people, right? So questions like that. But number three, even though there are those uncertainties and things that are very unclear about the archeological record, at the same time, we do know some things with a great degree of assurance, perhaps the most important of which is that Alaska native people have inhabited Alaska for many millennia. Uh, by the way, some people sometimes claim that Native Americans may shifted territory over time and therefore that negates how serious colonialism is, kind of the argument of, well, people are, you know, always moving around. Uh, I want to push back a little bit against that from an archaeological perspective. First of all, it's not entirely clear that this was always sort of a violent displacement when groups moved into different areas. So, for example, here in the Kenai Peninsula, uh, you have the Denina group that shows up shortly after we don't find or, and, but before them, there was the Marine Kachemak tradition, and we don't find really any Marine Kachemak sites after the Dinaida get there. Now, we could read violence into the record and assume that the Dinaida displaced the Kachemak violently, um, but the sites don't really overlap, and it's just as logical to assume that the Marine Kachemak just left the area, and then the Dinaida came in and made use of an area that was at that point open, uh, or that the groups voluntarily uh, interacted and intermingled in some ways. And so, we want to kind of point out that a lot of times these displacements were not violent. Even if they were, that doesn't really negate the seriousness of colonialism, which is on an entirely different scale. And in any case, we're not trying to understand the impact of violence that happened 8,000 years ago. We're trying to understand the impact of colonialism today. And so it's a bit of a moot discussion. But it is just one thing to think about the way that sometimes archaeology can get politicized and drawn into political arguments uh, in ways that probably isn't appropriate for the science. Uh, some of the takeaways from this class is archaeological record is valuable and clear in some ways, and sparse and confusing in others. That sacred histories, such as the one you read from Peter Falf Sorensen, tell us some things. They don't tell us everything, but they certainly tell us some things. And that whichever kinds of sacred stories we're choosing to adopt or choosing to view history through, origins matter to the extent they inform the present. Both types of origin stories teach us valuable things about the present and help us better understand Alaska Native people today. Thank you so much for your time.